Hello, Healthcare Experience Matters listeners. Today, we have on the program Dr. George Maisel. Dr. Maisel is a board-certified internist, a geriatrician, and a physician coach and speaker with the Healthcare Experience Foundation. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about effective physician and patient communication, and there is a really helpful and informative infographic that I will make sure gets posted within the description of this podcast episode today that you can use to kind of reference um, as we move through today's conversation with Dr. Maisel. Uh, Dr. Maisel, before we kick it off here, why don't you just give listeners a little bit of background on yourself, and then I'll start jumping into asking you some questions. Yeah, that, happy to, Casey. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I think you said a lot of my background, but uh, on top of that, um, I was in practice for about a dozen years. I've been chief medical officer of a number of hospitals and systems. I've been CEO of a clinically integrated network, and I've done a lot of consulting uh, in the administrative hospital space. Um, and so, again, I've been working with uh, Healthcare Experience now for foundation for three or four years now, um, and I've been really, really enjoyed coaching and, and working with physicians and other healthcare leaders. I've also written a number of books on healthcare on lean, burnout, physician alignment, um, and population health. So, um, yeah, this is the, the fun part of things is uh, giving back and getting involved in, in making healthcare better. So just to set the stage for today's interview, um, I want to, first of all, ask you about how the effective physician and patient communication kind of has a positive impact on health outcomes overall. Well, again, I think it's no great secret that um, the the most effective healthcare interaction and and patient-physician experience is based on good communication. Um, But beyond that, it also contributes to um, great experience for both the patient and the physician, and also to better outcomes. Patients are more compliant; um, they they do better, and and actually, it's it's good for both sides. And I think you know some of the challenges um, we all take it very much for granted. It's not something you're generally taught as you're as you're training to be a physician, and we we learn it sort of by trial and error as we're in practice, and we develop certain styles that work and and perhaps some that don't work. And and sometimes we're not even aware of it. And then on top of that, you add the stressors of what's, you know, a new payment model in in healthcare, um, the new employment models, um, the COVID and post COVID situation. And you add all that additional stress and and just pressure of, of seeing patients quicker, faster, leaner, meaner. And it just becomes much more critical and much more challenging. So as a physician who is looking to practice effective communication with patient, um, why is it important to avoid saying things like, don't worry, it will be fine? What's wrong with some of those generalizations? Yeah, I think what sort of happens, we all kind of get our own style. And sometimes when you're really rushed, you, you tend to sort of say things that, you know, that you think are just to encourage things to move on quickly so you can get to diagnosing the problem. Um, and some of these things um, to a patient, if you try to really put yourself in their, in their uh, place, you realize they don't sound, that's not what patients want to hear. Of course, they're going to worry. Um, you know, I think it's more important that you be upfront, and honest with them and, you know, placating them with, don't worry, it'll be fine. Um, really doesn't generally make them feel better. And what we're talking about here is changing some of the phrases and words. We're not talking about spending more time necessarily. Um, We're talking about just being more efficient and and more thoughtful about our communication and, you know, kind of reading the room, understanding what your patients are thinking and feeling. And in these days of, as I'll call it, Dr. Google in quotes there, um, how can physicians help patients sort of uh, sort through the abundance of information on the internet, Um, maybe help point them in the right direction as to some reliable resources. Uh, Instead of saying things like, you know, don't trust the internet at all. I'm the doctor. Listen to me. Yeah, I think we we all use the internet for things. Um, I mean, I do, you do, you know, we all look up things and it's a great source of truth. The challenge in healthcare is it's a source of great 
good information and a source of really unreliable and bad information. And sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. And sometimes in healthcare, things are linked in ways that the internet just doesn't do. Um, so I think using the internet has its own advantages and disadvantage. But again, telling people not to do it, they're going to do it. So I think, and telling them not, you know, not to listen to it, that's just not going to happen. So I think what you have to do is acknowledge that there are good and bad resources on the internet, um, and then point to trusted sources and say, you know, stay away from kind of all the, you know, the nonsense sites. And, you know, if you stick with really trusted resources and, you know, you can tell what those are or, or they can be shared, um, you're going to get some pretty good information, but it's not going to be everything. And so, uh, again, there's difference between going, you know, going to med school for years and residency and training and experience and practice. And even as physicians, we use the internet or other resources to look up things, but we have the context to know what to look up and where it fits into the, into the whole patient care. And so that's really different. So you can't dismiss the internet um, because you, it, that's not going to fly. Um, but you have to somehow steer people toward reliable parts of the internet um, and then, you know, and directly comment on them um, and, and make sure folks know where they fit in. Because again, it may be absolute accurate things they find on the internet. It just may not be applying to their situation. Uh, so that's where that judgment and experience comes in that you're not going to get on Dr. Google. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I think it's really important um, to not dismiss the internet as a whole, um, which I think you've established and um, just kind of a matter of, uh, it's a little more nuanced than um, it being, you know, the internet is good or the internet is bad. So right. um, now tell us about the importance of teach back when it comes to effective physician patient communication. Well, I think teach back is just one tool. Um, there's a lot of different tools. Again, you know, when, when you look at all the evidence when patients feel like they had a great experience and then their compliance goes up and all the other things, their outcomes get better, it usually boils down to um, feeling like they were listened to and understood. And so there's a lot of ways to do that. And there's a lot of sort of ways to, to check. And, and patients often, especially if you give them, you know, some challenging news, they sometimes don't listen to the things you say after it, um, which is understandable. And so th I think, this is just one of the tools. There are many. It's just asking them to repeat um, what, what you told them to make sure they understand. Or the other thing you can do, it's, it's not literally teach back, but you can repeat what they've said to you so they know you've under, that you've understood them. So it's really just a lot of little tricks and nuances um, to making sure that you're actually talking to each other rather than talking at each other. In these times of the great resignation, why is it particularly important that the physician avoids saying things like we are understaffed or uh, I'm behind schedule? What's the problem with that? Well, I think if you're a patient, um, that's not really what you want to hear. That's really not helpful. That doesn't make you feel better. It doesn't make you feel confident. Um, you can certainly share with the patient. I'm sorry, we're very busy today. Um, and we're doing our best, or we had some emergencies and we got a little bit behind. I'm sure you understand that an emergency takes precedent, um, just like it would if you, the emergency was you. But when you start talking about um, understaffed and things like that, people really don't want to hear it. it. It, you know, they want to know how it's going to affect them. Um, and all that's going to do is hurt their confidence and, and trust in your, you and your institution. So again, they, they know what's going on. They're not naive. But, but talking to patients and telling them that you're understaffed is really not something we like to hear. Because again, I don't know about you, but when I'm, when I'm somewhere, I don't want to hear that you're understaffed. Um, that's kind of not my problem. I want to know that I'm going to get good whatever, care, treatment, uh, service at a restaurant, whatever. Um, so I, I think we would encourage not to use those kind of phraseology. Um, the other ones that come to mind is it's not my job. There's just certain things that just really... Um, are not helpful in patients that are obviously scared and worried and want to know what's going on with their own health. Boy, that is uh, like nails on the chalkboard. I think it, it, saying something like um, that's not my job, right. That would be difficult to, uh, to hear as a patient. Um, 
So, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. That is, those are, there's definitely some phrases to avoid. And I think that's why this infographic that we'll be sharing with this podcast is so helpful. It it really does break things down um, as simple as say this, not that in many of these situations. And that's the thing. The statements are things you'd be saying anyway. You'd just be saying them in a different way. So we we know folks are time pressured. Um, So we're not trying to extend the conversation necessarily. We're just trying to make it a, a more efficient conversation. And let's talk active listening. Um, How can healthcare providers better demonstrate active listening and listening to understand? I think that can be a challenge because, you know, so often, at least I always found, you know, you can walk in a room and if you just had a really challenging patient or you just got a phone call from the hospital, sometimes it's really hard to focus in on, on the patient in front of you, even though you want to and you mean to, you're just, your mind's just going. So one of the things you sort of have to do you know, it's just some simple tricks. One is um, not processing your answer while you're trying to listen to their answer. So sometimes we have get a tendency to try to, um, or interrupting, average doc interrupts a patient in 11 seconds, whereas generally they can usually get the full thought out in 40 seconds. So it's not huge time differences. Um, things like just simple nodding or saying yes, or the teach back tool we just mentioned, um, all those things contribute to that active listening. If patients feel like you've heard them, um, you're going to get much better information, much more accurate, and ultimately it's going to be a better experience for you and the patient. And as I said, the outcomes tend to be better because compliance is better. So it's really just about, you know, being in the moment, trying to focus on where you are, thinking about what they're saying. And again, sometimes just repeating what they're saying as kind of a tool to get you to focus. On, on what they're saying, because again, I, I know when I'm in that situation, uh, you know, it's really easy to start thinking about the, the you know, the, the complicated case in the hospital or the pa- next patient in the room that, you know, has, you know, some significant issues and, um, you know, patients, um, patients sense that even if they don't um, feel it. And, and again, we also probably remind folks that only 7% of the communication is verbal. Um, it's all body language and, um, and tone that really transfer the message. So be aware of not just what you say, but the tone that you say it with and, and the, you know, your body language as you're delivering any kind of message or queries. Well, this has been another very informative and great interview with Dr. George Mazel, board certified internist, geriatrician and physician coach and speaker with the Healthcare Experience Foundation. Again, I will encourage everyone listening to this episode to check out that infographic that we will post with this podcast. Dr. Maisel, I'm going to give you the final word here today. Um, Is there anything else valuable uh, you'd like to mention before we wrap it up here? I think we've we've covered most of it. I think I just want to sort of once again emphasize, you know, that I know people take this kind of stuff for granted because especially if you've been in practice for years and years and years, or if you just got out of residency and you think you've kind of just been educated as much as you could possibly be educated. And I think we all still have a lot to learn about doing this better. So some of these, you know, little tricks and phrases are are simple things to do. They don't take more time. And, and, you know, you're going to be not only going to get that outcome for your patients, but you're going to walk around walk out more satisfied because again, um, you know, that's a real challenge these days in, in, in trying busy post COVID, um, post COVID times. You have been listening to Dr. George Maisel on today's episode of healthcare experience matters. Thank you, Dr. Maisel for your time today. Yeah. Casey, thank you. Have a great day.